Well, welcome again. This is a workshop I've been contemplating for some time. Uh, really, it's pretty simple. And a lot of you might be familiar if you know the work I do or some of the work of the people we're talking about uh, with the information I'm going to give. But I think the historical perspective is important. I always think the historical perspective is important. You know, I have a I have a great library and, and I was looking around the other day and I was thinking, not so much for elite athletes, uh, but for the everyday person, the, the, what I call sometimes the rest of us or everybody else, when, when if you read Can You Go, um, what are the books that have helped me the most? And you know, one quick thing, and since I've retired from, you know, uh, active athletics, which is sort of kind of true, though every day I think I'm going to have a new comeback. These all these lessons all apply to me now, too. So the books I'm going to be talking about and the authors, um, sadly, you won't get a chance to see this one very well, but Irving Dardick and Dennis Waitley's book, Quantum Fitness, uh, the book that really changed my life the most uh, when working with everybody else. In Fitness and in Health, Everyone is an a Athlete by Phil Maffetone. Phenomenal book. And this is the British edition because I picked it up there. I got the original American edition uh, from Art Devaney, and this is called The Devaney Diet. Um, yeah, all the books are uh, kind of game changers for me. And as I go through the books, I keep getting more and more and more insights out of them. And I'd like to maybe share some of that with you. So this talk is Dardic, Maffey, Tone, and Devaney, Lesser Known Pioneers of Modern Training for the Rest of Us. Many of you listening have no idea what I just said, so let's take a, a look backwards. Until 1974, my world, weightlifting, was a pretty simple place to be. Things were a lot different back then. Back then, and this is when I first started lifting, I started lifting in 1965. By 1970, 71, I started keeping a journal. By 1974, um, even though I was probably, I was, what, 16 years old, I was probably stronger than just about everybody in the audience listening, listening, and I'm not exaggerating, because I listened to smart people, and it was easy at the time. And I say this thing, lifting is what athletes, bodybuilders, and crazy people, the nuts, did. Uh, it, when I first started to lift, and I mention this sometimes, they, I was told that if I lifted weights, two things would happen. I would become muscle-bound, so tightly wound I couldn't move. And I was told I'd become a homosexual. Now, that is so inappropriate and so disingenuous, it's hard to say out loud without being a little embarrassed. But I have to. I have to bring that up because that's literally what I was told at the time. Um, I'm, it's, it's amazing to see how far we've come in some things and, of course, how much more progress we have to make in so many others. At the time, the answer to all questions in, in my world was protein. Uh, with Dick Mountmeyer, if your front squat wasn't coming up, you needed more protein shakes. Uh, if <laughs> you broke up with a girlfriend, you need more protein. The interesting thing is I look back on the high school pictures, you know, very, very few people were fat. Uh, when you look at uh, family photos from the 60s or 50s, look at the pictures closely. There isn't, what we considered a fat person back then was, was A, rare, and B, you didn't see many of them. I have read a lot about it. I've asked people about it. There's a lot of theories about it. Everyone says the easy one is we eat more calories, and that might be true. But it could be the plastic in foods. It could be uh, the ready availability of cheap carbohydrates. I mean, you know, let's be honest. It's easy to get a pretty inexpensive, high-calorie meal in America today. The next one, you know, I look back on, you know, the physical education program that I had at Southwood Junior High, and I never saw anything like it since then. Uh, we did marching. We played every game imaginable. We had to run uh, 800 meters every day and then do an obstacle course. We did push-ups every day. We did sit-ups every day. Uh, we did pull-ups every day. We lifted weights. We wrestled. We, And it's just not that way anymore, folks. It just simply isn't that way. We also watch movies about sports. and You just don't get that anymore. And by the way, most of my friends hated P.E. For me, it was a revelation and I loved it. And also at the time, up until about 1974, women did this thing called toning. Now, 
The word tone comes from the same root as tune, like a tune of violin, or if you uh, have a boat, you try to have your rigs all tighten at the right time. That's what toning or tuning was. Uh, and yet, when I look at the magazines and I look at the women are doing, a lot of the stuff they were doing back then is far smarter than what we see now. And everything changed after 1974. Now, I've been looking for as many loops as I can to figure out what happened. In my world, the biggest change was the book by Arnold, Arnold, The Education of a Bodybuilder, 1977. I bought it the first day it came out, first day. I think I was the first person to buy it at the bookstore. And I read the book and I realized that, um, I hate to say this about maybe the greatest bodybuilder in history, but I felt like I knew more because he didn't talk about cleaning jerks and snatches and some other things. Um, he didn't talk about loaded carries, but if you're a bodybuilder, you better read that book and follow what he says. The first six months you should do body weight only training. Uh, I was also at the premiere in San Francisco of the movie Pumping Iron. Uh, in fact, uh, Arnold pulled up, looked at the crowd, saw me, realized I might be the only person who's ever lifted weights, and came over to me and said, how did you like the movie? And I said, jeepers, it's swell, or something like that. And of course, there's that fi famous line in, in the movie about how when he's getting the pump, he starts coming, and he's also coming with the woman, and he says famously, I'm coming all the time, which became more famous when he became the governor of California. At the same time, so we have the rise, the almost immediate rise, for those of us around there, you'll remember this, of bodybuilding, but we also were facing at the same time, or had at the same time, the jogging boom. And I include the 1972 Olympic marathon because an American by the name of Frank Shorter won it. And that seemed to tie in to James Fix's book, The Complete Book of Running. Uh, Fix famously, of course, died uh, running, uh, and that's... George Sheehan's wonderful works on running and being, for example. Uh, he was a doctor and very insightful. Bill Bowerman, the Oregon coach, coming back and bringing us from New Zealand this concept called jogging, uh, which has been made fun of in movies, jogging. I would also throw in Dave Waddle's 800-meter win at the Olympics uh, because that had a huge impact on track and field, at least where I was from. Uh, runners started wearing little beanie caps when they... Uh, baseball caps when they ran. We'd never seen that before. At the same time, the book uh, Fit or Fat, a binary title, which kind of gets under my nerves. And of course, Covert Bailey, who later had a very famous PBS series, he and all his ticks and quirks. Uh, basically, aerobics, 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 and as no fat at all. Uh, he says famously in the book, Someone will raise their hand and ask about sodium. He'd say, let's deal with the fat first. And at this time, we start to run into this idea from these that fat in food is bad. And so we want to low fat, no fat, get rid of fat. And it's interesting, at the same time we did that in all of our food, the obesity spiral began to happen. Um, almost at the same time, uh, Jane Fonda came out in 1982 with the, the VHS tapes, uh, not beta, by the way. I've been told that, and I remember when beta tapes were around, they were far better for watching football games. The problem is this whole system disappeared. It was a superior product. Uh, it only had one wheel, I think. Uh, it was much faster, to, especially watching games and movies, but it just never caught on. Part of it, I was told, was that porn used VHS and, of course, exercise tapes were on VHS. There's a little odd history, and there you go. Interesting, uh, because at the same time, um, Jane Fonda talks about going for the burn. Go for the burn. You know, you're doing fire hydrants, fire hydrants or kickbacks. You want to get the burn. Get the burn, get the burn. Arnold, you know, with the pump, burn, pump, burn, pump, long-distance jogging. And we begin to move as in the fitness industry and the way we approach everybody else is that it has to burn, it has to pump. We have to be like uh, the industrial top-down model of the more it hurts, the better it is for you. Oddly, and I just want to, before I go on, in the 60s, two things did happen that really were helpful. Uh, first, 
John F. Kennedy started the physical fitness, uh, the President's Physical Fitness Council, and they came out with some guidelines for Americans on what does fit mean, and they were measurable tests. Uh, when I was young, we did the Harvard step test. Uh, you had to do certain runs and then take your heart rate. If you got a run done in a certain amount of time, you were fitter than someone who didn't run as fast as you. There was a push-up standard, pull-up standard, calisthenic standard. But also Ken Cooper came out with a book called Aerobics, a word he invented, as we now sort of know. Uh, his later editions, by the way, uh, were much more friendly to weightlifting and taking antioxidants. Now, as we look in 220 back on antioxidants, we also now know that antioxidants have to be used correctly. And I don't want to get in too much depth on that, but there was a very famous Finnish study where two, uh, when taking antioxidants actually had a negative health benefit, which kind of shocked everybody. Also, too, in Covert Bailey's defense, in his later works, he does come out much more positive about weightlifting, although in his early works, he was clearly, clearly negative. So this is where many people were taught what to do. Now, there are two people from this period that I have, and I still use a lot of their materials. The first is Dr. Leonard Schwartz. And uh, he was an interesting guy. He found himself overweight one day. He's a doctor. So he kind of figured out a thing that we would know today as heavy hands or what he called pan aerobics. If all you do is run, all you're using is your legs. In fact, Dr. Sheehan, who I just mentioned, mentioned in one of his books, um, when you run, you get your legs in shape and then bring the rest of your body with you. Well, Leonard Schwartz, also a doctor, believed that it was far more important to use all your limbs when training, and he called it pan across, everything aerobics. Uh, I use the phrase now inefficient exercise because walking, and I do this at least two days a week, with weights in your hand is far more inefficient than just going for a stroll. The amount, and I can see it through my heart rate uh, monitor numbers, walking with two pounds to 10 pound weights radically changes my heart rate. In fact, I can almost dial in my heart rate by the amount of weight I use in my hands with no change in time per mile. Um, his goal was to get your up your VO2 max across four limbs, your legs and your upper body. The other person I'd like to mention is Clarence Bass. Uh, partially, I would have liked to mention him because he's the first email I ever sent. Uh, in one of his books, he talked about doing the Atkins diet and it didn't work for him, he got really weird. But he didn't really follow the Atkins diet. He did high protein, low fat, low carb. But that's not the Atkins diet. The Atkins diet, as many of you should know, is high protein, fairly high numbers of fat, and zero or just limited, limited carbs. And I pointed that out to him and he emailed me back. I would not say a nasty letter, but he, he said that, no, that's not what it is. But then I, yeah. But it was nice, and I've always followed his work. He's the first website I spent quality time on when I first went online, probably in 1998. And we'll go, we'll talk about a few things right now that influenced my career. One thing is he's a lawyer. He's one of the, he clean and jerked 300 pounds at a very young teenage age. Uh, and then of course he became famous as a master bodybuilder for his lean condition. Uh, he, he wrote a series of books and articles called Ripped. And he wrote for Muscle and Fitness for a long time. And, of course, some articles, very good articles in the old Iron Man magazine. Um, a couple of things about him. Uh, his, he's very much like Covert Bailey. Uh, fat is evil. Uh, trim it, get rid of it. Though he has changed this over time. If you read his early works, it is anti-fat all up and down. One thing that really liked about him is I read one of his books and he referenced a book by Jan and Terry Todd, the late Terry Todd, a good friend of mine, and Jan about a four month uh, hypertrophy, strength, power, and reload, deload month. Um, and when I read that, I changed the way I trained and it worked really well for me post my Middle East uh, uh, illness issues. Um, so he really introduced me to a style of bodybuilding cycling, periodization, 
that worked well for me. It didn't carry well over into the power events, the discus and the Olympic lifting, but was nice as that got me back on track as a, as a lifter and thrower. He also believed in combining bodybuilding with aerobics. Uh, when you read his work, his his approach to aerobics is very much like the set and rep protocols we would use in the weight room. With the exercise, the uh, aerodyne, uh, he, for example, recommends um, taking one limb off. So you might be doing your four limb aerodyne. You take your right hand off for a minute. You take your left hand off for a minute. You take your right foot off for a minute. You take your left foot off for a minute. And that kind of, it's nice. It actually works well because it keeps you from that uh, relative boredom you get doing aerodyne. Uh, I keep trying to figure out how to do that with a rowing machine, but it seems to be mostly aerodyne friendly. Uh, two things that I do have to thank him for is he's the first person I've ever read to explain the Tabata protocol. And since um, I wasn't gonna do it for endurance, I experimented with several lifts on doing Tabatas and that's when I fell into the Tabata front squat workouts, which became a real center of my training program uh, throughout the 90s, especially uh, the 2000s, I'm sorry, when to get ready for weightlifting meets. Uh, twice a month, I would do that four minute Tabata front squat to prepare myself for the conditioning you need for a weightlifting meet, and it changed my life. The other thing I wanna mention is he and Terry Todd had a conversation one time about aging and they both agreed that one of the things you have to be careful of was losing your spring, your ability to, and I think the example was just getting up on a curb. And when I read that, and then uh, that really hit me because one of the signs of old age, of course, is uh, besides the loss of strength, is a loss of fast twitch muscle fibers. Uh, Clarence Bass took that advice and began Olympic lifting again, basically this power snatch and the power clean. And I've kept that in my mind since that, since that time, the importance of doing fast twitch work for adults. As much as I like both Clarence Bass and Leonard Schwartz, they still were a little bit more in that area of, uh, of the traditional model of aerobics and bodybuilding, which is fine and it has its place. I did want to mention them, mostly to let you know that what I'm... I don't want you to think this is bad, but I do think there's a better way to approach things. And it brings us in to when I first heard about Dr. Irving Dardick, a vascular surgeon. Now, if you go online, you'll find out that he got in trouble late in his career, but I think he was set up. If you read the entire story, uh, he was trying different ways to help people with different kinds of uh, illnesses and he tried to do something called wave training, which is, of course, his later word for rhythmic interval training. Uh, when you read the whole thing, it uh, certainly you could blame Dardic, but you can also, the situation wasn't good. Having said that, his work was very important to me. He tells us how he got involved with training Olympic athletes. When I was a physician at the last Olympic Games, Athletes would come up to me about questions about training, about nutrition, about drugs. That's what got, gave me the idea to talk to the United States Olympic Committee about setting up institutes. At the same time he's doing this institute, setting up this institute, Jack Kelly, who's, uh, who's an Olympian, whose sister was Princess Grace Kelly of Monaco, uh, died of a heart attack. Uh, he was an Olympic rower. Also, James Fix went for that famous run where he died on his run. And Dardick was also beginning to notice that he had very, very few issues with sprinters. He seemed to be spending a lot of his time helping long distance runners. And it made him step back and look at that and then think about hunter gatherers. And this will be a theme that pops up several times. Um, at the Lake Placid facility, he was also there with Gideon Ariel, who was really, truly one of the early biomechanic guys. Um, Ariel takes a lot of credit for people's improvements, um, which is, I've actually talked to one of the people who he takes massive amount of credit for, and he was helpful. My good friend Brian Oldfield one time made a very good point. Uh, Ariel's work was done in two dimensions, uh, which X and Y. 
But the problem with us throwers is that we live in Z. Uh, I don't know, but for a while, I was one of the few people to have been done on two different occasions, three-dimensional biomechanical studies of my technique. And what was fascinating is when you look at the Z, the, the big sweeps and the discus and the hammer and the javelin and the shot, that's where the real throws come from. Let's talk about the book, though, that changed my life from Dr. Dardick. It comes out in 1984 as we're gearing up for the LA Olympics, and the book is called Quantum Fitness. And to be honest, I don't know if he could have a better title for a book. That's that's pretty good. I mean, that's, you know, that's like saying Star Wars fitness to me. And basically, he came up with this concept is that your training is five rings. And honestly, it wasn't until recently that I appreciated what he was trying to say with the first ring. One, you are the architect of your fitness. You, gentle listener, you, me, we're in charge. And it took me a while to kind of get my head around that. But his point is good. Most people have this Soviet Union top-down mentality. And I hear it all the time. Dan, just give me a program. Dan, just give me a diet. Well, that's fine. But rarely does a diet work for anybody. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell you to drink iced tea. I don't like iced tea. I'm going to tell you to eat broccoli. I hate broccoli. I'm going to teach you to eat lamb. I can't eat lamb. Okay, what do you, Did you see what just happened there? I was top-downing the approach. You are in charge. Number two is something that really helped my career immensely. Uh, um, it's called quantum force. And the key word there in red is adaption. Now, we call it different things now, but I have been doing this since this time. This is what he called adaptive relaxation. Many of you might call it meditation. It's when you lay down, you breathe out, you calm yourself, and then you drift off. I can always tell when I'm tired because I drift off into a nap, but I'm a big believer in the app on the phone called One Moment Meditation, a one minute free meditation device, uh, OMM. It's available on iTunes, I'm sure everywhere. And I also use Brain.FM's meditation techniques. Um, since that, when I first started doing that, I had some issues with sleeping. Ever since then, I can fall asleep generally about anywhere. I'm still struggling to fall asleep in coach seats in uh, planes. The next one was simulation cycles, and we've come so far since 1984. But basically, the idea in simulation cycles is to think of your brain as a VH VHS machine, okay, or D uh, DVD, or uh, is that you put yourself in a situation where you simulate what you're going to do in competition or in, a, in for everybody else, how you're going to talk to your boss or how you're going to talk to your children. If you've ever had to have a tough conversation with your children, there's a good chance you practice a few times what and how you wanted to say it. In my book, Now What?, I take you into a much more modern look at it. Uh, and it's great, great to, for me to sit here and think about me doing a discus turn. That's great. But what really impacts you at competition is if it's raining, if I've had a few bad throws, I didn't sleep well last night, you need to practice simulating what could possibly go wrong. Uh, and that, of course, uh, and then you have to practice appropriately after that. What happens if you find yourself here? Uh, I use that as an American football coach. I've used it as a track coach, obviously, and use it as a weightlifting coach. And... Uh, because of these, these practicing uh, the areas of arousal, tension, and heart rate, I was able to uh, pull a number of victories out in my career that maybe I shouldn't have. Or I coached athletes to a situation where they were able to deal with practically anything that was thrown at them. Ring number three is what he called quantum nutrition. And the big key here for him was variety. It's interesting for me to look at this because when I went to the Olympic Training Center for the first time in 1984, we were told vegetables, protein, and water. And it's interesting to see his list is almost the same, 
fiber-based carbohydrates, lean source protein, and clear water. And frankly, that's not bad. That's a, not a bad way to look at your entire diet. And one thing he really emphasizes in the book is trying to change uh, each of those sources, except for clear water, as often as you can. You know, eat the whole buffet of vegetables, eat the whole buffet of protein options. Ring number four is what he called quantum exercise. And it's interesting because I still use that toolkit from the book today. His major point here was rhythm. And that is something that really struck me when I first read the book. The idea of undulating your rhythms in a training program. The first thing he talked about was something he called core balance, which I'll go into depth in just a moment. And then something I had never heard of, rhythmic, or I should say rhythmic endurance, so that there's these pulses of heart rate through your workout as you go through. There would be a period of uh, raising your heart rate, letting it calm down, raising a little higher, let it come down, raising a little higher. In that Soviet model, like I know people for a long time I get up and I jog three miles every day. Okay, what else you do? I get up every day and jog three miles. Every day. They go from start to finish and done. Which, by the way, is better than nothing. But where are the rhythms of life? And we live on this planet that has a lot of rhythm and there's none there. And finally, this concept called multi-joint exercises that frankly had been getting lost by 1984. Now... I Olympic lifted at the time, so I was getting multi-joint exercises done. But his ideas, I thought, were kind of good because he was going to tie multi-joint exercises into endurance training too. Ring five is what he called the quantum leap, or what we could just summarize today is synergy. One plus one equals three. If you do the mental work, the adaptive relaxation and simulation, if you take time to make sure your nutrition is optimal and you do an intelligent training program, you're going to pop up. You're going to have this kind of goal much easier than if you just pounded yourself in the face with one of those. Let's talk specifically because that's more my focus about his training ideas. The first word is core balance. Now, for those of you in 2000, uh, the 2020s and on, uh, you're going to recognize this movement as the hip thrust. Uh, we were shown the hip thrust back at the Olympic Training Center in 1984, and I thought to myself, I'm not going to do that in a gym. I was absolutely wrong. Um, the first part of this chapter is on what Arthur Devaney would call the brace, but basically it was getting your belt line parallel to the ground. Now, this information was from earlier. Lawrence Morehouse talks about it in his books, The Great UCLA uh, Human Performance uh, Instructor. Um, but basically, it's the idea of having some abdominal going on, bring your belt line to parallel to the ground so that you have a balance between your ab wall and your glutes holding your, your what we sometimes call your bucket uh, the, uh, your, or bowl. Your bowl is your pelvic bowl and your rib cage is a box. You want your box on the bowl. You don't want that if this is my zipper and this is my butt. We don't want to walk around like this or like this. We want to walk around like that. So really, first off is just practicing standing with your belt line parallel to the ground. He also had a number of hip thrust variations, including, um, well, I don't see any loading on there. That's a much later thing. Um, a modified V-up, which we'll come back to in a little bit. Uh, where you're pushing your lower back into the ground and then just very gently pulling your ab wall up, uh, the modern crunch. And then, of course, the opposite was what we would call sit-ups between uh, laying on the ground and just bringing both legs to the air. I'm laying face down on the ground, laying on the ground, bringing both hands up in the air. And then, of course, the Superman where your legs and upper body come up off the ground. This is 1984, and these are still wonderful things to do today. In the area of rhythmic endurance, or what he called right, rhythmic interval training exercise. In the book, he bases it on the 220 minus age thing. Now, many of us who've been around a while know that this is basically an invented number 
from the, uh, from the uh, people who gave us universal machines. But it's fine, it works, but they always have to have other formulas to make it go on. I'll use Maffetone's numbers in just a few minutes. Dardick says an important thing in an interview. We never took into account the other side of the equation, the recovery side. Now it's interesting as I go on, we never train the recovery to handle the stress of exercise. Maffey Tone will say basically the exact same thing. Now, I found an article, a place called Holistic Primary Care, where they give us this nice little review of how he did this. A typical Dardic protocol involves one minute of high intensity exercise on a stationary bike or trampoline, for example, followed by complete rest. Complete rest. You get your heart up, then you stop. Heart goes up, you stop. During exertion, the heart rate is much higher than in traditional sustained exercise. When the heart rate falls near, uh, near resting, the person does another exertion cycle, again followed by complete recovery. The cycles are done five times over a period of half an hour. During an exercise period, the heart rate rises and falls five times. Cycles are done three to four times a week. And some of you look at that and go, that's crazy. Well, to a track and field coach is not because that's exactly what we do on the field. Uh, we raise the heart rate and then we just let it come back down because we're trying to have optimal performance. Um, the idea of having the heart rate rise and fall, rise and fall, rise and fall versus sustained seems odd to many people who fall in love with their heart rate monitors. They want to stay three or four hours at this higher rate, Dardic is arguing, bring it up, bring it down, bring it up, bring it down. Interesting is that there's going to be research after him that supports what he just said for your heart health. When it came to multi-joint exercises, with his multi-joint exercises, you could also train your interval training doing multi-joint. He uh, talks about using squats for your heart rate. By the way, it works really well. If you put a heart rate monitor on and you do goblet squats or overhead squats, you're going to see your heart rate spike and drop over time. He talked about something called plyometrics, which uh, during the time probably was the biggest wave of plyo training. Uh, many of us were already saying we've gone too far with it, and we did. Lots of people got hurt doing it. But if you read his book, it's high knee walking, skipping, running stairs, running hills, um, and actually a few other things, and just basically running, using a mini trampoline, uh, the rowing machine, and any of the cycling machines. But he also said you could do this with multi-joint exercises, and his exercises in the weight room would be push-ups, uh, an adapted curl, chin-ups, an adapted tricep press, discus throw, which was basically a long waving movement back and forth that he called the discus throw, uh, butt kicks, that's when you run in place and your heels kick your butt, which is kind of applying metrics we use them in the track and field daily, and leg swings, hold on to a chair and swing your legs in multiple directions. If you use a heart rate monitor, any of these exercises can become a interval training movement. Um, to finally here, this was all about adaption while trying to avoid, avoid exhaustion in what we call overtraining. When this book came out, I am not sure anybody else was talking about this kind of thing. Uh, I know a lot of us invent things after they've been out for a while, but this was fairly brand new to me. Having said that, if you're from a track and field background or even a swimming background, you would probably recognize the basics of this. Now, as much as I loved Dardick's book and I, and I started using his materials, especially when I would coach uh, non-athletes, it was Phil Maffetone's Everyone is an Athlete book when I got it in 1987 that really made me go, wow. This book was a gift from a friend of mine, Dr. Kevin Morgan, and he was a chiropractor, as Phil Maffetone is, who practiced a system called Applied Kinesiology, which Maffetone is also into. Uh, it was all about muscle imbalances, and I got to tell you, at first sometimes some of it seemed strange, but 
when you looked in total, some of it made sense. For example, one time, uh, Dr. Morgan had me sniff just a little cap of Clorox and my right hip flexor, which at the time was bugging me, now that we know I, I have other issues, it makes more sense, just completely stopped working. And he said, you know, I would not suggest swimming in swimming pools until you kind of get this whole back and uh, hip. And I go, why? He goes, chlorine is not your friend. Oddly, I started noticing that when I would go to chlorinated pools, I wasn't, I wasn't at my best. If I went to the ocean, I seemed fine. Dr. Morgan gave us a great exercise that basically is the same one that Dardic taught us. And we called it, at, uh, at my athletes called it for years, Morgan ab exercises or Doc Morgan ab exercises. You push back as hard as you can into the floor when you're laying down on it. You isolate the ab wall. You come up a little bit and you do tiny twists. Um, we one day tried to do a hundred of those. I don't recall making it because the stress on the ab wall was so high. Through Dr. Morgan's ideas on training and reading Maffy Tone's book, that's when I started, this is when I first experimented with the, what we now call the transformation program, having one minute rest, full body lifts, and we got much more into hill sprints from the, reading this book. Uh, one of the lines from the book, and I, we all know it's a cliche, but Maffy Tone's concept of the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step just really finally slapped me across the face at this time. If I wanted to make myself an athlete again, I had to slow down and not pretend I was the person I was when I was 21, but accept the fact that I was a different person after my experiences in the Middle East. One of the things that uh, I like most about Maffy Tone is his yes foods on this thing called the two-week test. Now, I get it. You can't probably read that very well, but that's okay. Uh, if you read uh, McDougall's book, Natural Born Heroes, this is in there. Or you can just type in Maffy Tone two-week test and you'll get the diet. As I look over this diet, though, raw and cooked vegetables, uh, tree nuts, that's uh, macadamians, al al almonds, almonds, uh, walnuts, um, for example, uh, coconut, all you want, beef, turkey, lamb, fish, eggs, I can't eat shellfish, a hard cheese, some soft cheeses, I like brie, um, cream, heavy cream is fine, avocado, coconut, and olive oil, um, what do we got, vegetable juices, I'll come back to that in just a minute, coffee or tea, delicious iced tea, uh, some kinds of vinegar, by the way, apple cider vinegar, uh, Dr. Jarvis's uh, Vermont Folk Medicine book, Apple Cider Vinegar is the answer to all questions. Uh, if you're going to drink, uh, it's got to be gin, vodka, or whiskey. And uh, dry red wines, I see my good friend Pinot Noir there. And uh, dry white wines, white wines, including Chardonnay and Pinot Grigio. As I look at that list there right now, I say to myself, that's a great eating program for anybody, anywhere. But what he does from there is then you add a food and see how you react to it. I mean, I think you would do well just focusing on that. It's very similar, though, to what Dardic said. You have a huge selection of vegetables there, uh, of, of carb fiber-based carbohydrates. You've got plenty of protein sources. And really, I mean, uh, Maffito is great about recommending water. When Maffy Tone talks about aerobics, I think is when he shines the most. It's logical, reasonable, doable. His big thing, and this was a game changer for me, uh, when he talked about what your max heart rate should be generally if you're trying to do aerobic work. 180 minus your age. Now, if you're taking, if you have to take medicine, you make that 170 minus your age. If you're ill, 160 minus your age. That is an underappreciated thing that Maffy Tone talks about. And your re recovery turnaround is 160 minus age. Now listen, folks, what that, what that means for me today as I'm talking to you, that means when I'm training my, when I'm training my zone now, uh, it kind of sort of breaks my heart to be this honest with you, but 180 minus 63 is... You know, it's not very high. It's 117. So I try to keep my heart rate around one, 105 to 115 when I'm doing our rucking, 
when I'm doing rowing on the, on the rower I have here, I try to keep it there as long as I can. Um, I have my heart rate monitor set that if it goes too high, I get a little beep, beep, beep. And if it gets below that 160, if it gets below 97, 96, it beeps again. Though I don't have to worry about that as much because I'm wearing a 60 pound vest and I have weights in my hand. It's a great way to train if you want to be a fat burner, not a sugar burner. Most of us have no issues burning sugar. Burning fat is the issue. Once a month, uh, Mike and Kevin and I, we do this thing called the maximal Maximum aerobic function test. <clears throat> Keeping my heart rate between those two numbers, 180 minus age and 160 minus age, we do a one mile walk and we then put the time down. We continue going, we remember the time for another mile. We continue going and remember the time for a third mile. And what we're trying to get over months is to have mile one be a little faster mile two be a little faster, mile three be a little faster. What we've noticed, at least in my case, is my mile times, yes, I add about a minute per mile, because I'm worried about the heart rate, it's easier and easier to get the heart rate to go up over time. Uh, the idea though, is if the first time I do this, it takes me 19 minutes to walk a mile, uh, I have a weight vest on and I do have very light weights in my hands, to keep my heart rate at those numbers. Uh, I don't want to run or jog or cycle. I want to just, I just want to walk. Um, it might take me 19 minutes the first time, yet a month later, I'm down to 17.30. What that tells me is that my conditioning is improving. So there's a number of things that we're testing here. First, we've got to be very strict on what the mile is. And we have to be very strict on the, where our heart range is. And we have to be very strict about taking uh, accurate timings. Uh, all that sounds easy, but miles, heart rate, and time are three things we have to keep an eye on. If I suddenly notice, for example, if my heart, if to do that mile suddenly goes to 22, or I, to, to get 22 minutes to get a mile, and something south is happening, I better get that checked out quickly. The other thing about the Maffey Tone that I like is he had a big belief, and still does, that you get your aerobic bit base in before you go to anaerobic training. This has been the tradition in track and field for a long time. Many people are sliding away from it, but I'm concerned that if you only focus on high-end stuff like speed, that you might just burn your athletes apart over time. Um, this final thing was a real changing just really got me thinking and it changed the way I look at even coaching strength. He believes that first the nervous system adapts and I always use the example of typing. When you first learn to type, I don't scream in your ear, go faster, go faster. We give you time and after a few years, you're a very fast typist. Then Rob Wolf's, I love this phrase, you get that weird hormonal cascade. So first the nervous system and then the hormonal cascade. Uh, I've noticed that a few times in my life where I learn a new thing, like when I learned the Olympic lifts. At first, yeah, I put some weight on, and then all of a sudden I got the certain loads that my body said, I don't know what's going on, we got to get this guy bigger. And I leaped up, well, as famously, I went from 162 pounds to 202 pounds in four months. I put on 10 pounds a month. I was drug free, and I really wasn't taking any extra protein or anything, just my body, just super compensated. And then after the hormones kick in, then the cardiovascular system makes your improvements. So it's a good reminder when you read that because it's going to take a while for your cardiovascular system to start showing the changes. But you have to have all this together. And that's why you want the MAF test, the maximum aerobic function test to be done about once a month. It'll give you some insights on how your cardiovascular system is going. You know, I'm looking forward to a few months from now where my MAF test suddenly, you know, clearly improves uh, uh, by minutes uh, because I've finally built up my aerobic base. In the weight room, I've always liked Maffey Tone's insights. Now, this is just one thing he recommends, but I've always liked this. His idea of training is workout plus rest. 
that gets us right back to Dardic again. A workout session is both training and getting tired and sweaty, but it's also keeping rest in mind. This is a, a workout he not only rec recommends in his golfing book, but he recommends for many runners too. You warm up 15 minutes with a walk or easy run or something aerobic. I like the idea of walking. You do, then do deadlifts for five reps. He says in the 85, 80 to 85 pound uh, range, uh, but he's not working with strength athletes. Five reps at 85% for a strength athlete. Is, uh, those are good numbers. Then recovery is three minute rest, and then you slide to the squat. Rest three minutes, and then you just go deadlift, squat, deadlift, squat, deadlift, squat for about three to five rounds. Um, three to five rounds of five reps in the deadlift and squat with three minute rest, that's going to be a pretty interesting workout. And I think it's going to do, it's going to make you all over body strong, but you're not going to break down doing it. It's interesting and I like it. I haven't done it personally, but I like the way that looks. So a couple of tidbits. So after he started showing up, Mark Allen, of course, the greatest, probably the greatest triathlete in history, sought him out and very quickly went from always being injured and always struggling in the, in the biggest Ironmen to now winning them. And he also coached the, the, the record holder in the 1,000 mile run, which uh, is a lot of, was a lot of running. Um, there's some tidbits about the first edition. One thing I liked, and I couldn't find it in his second edition, was he talked about never compete the week you have a haircut. And when you first read that, it's like, what? This, what is this, Samson? No. His point was, if you can't find a week where you don't have a competition, you're clearly going to be overtraining soon. Um, it is interesting because it is weird how little things like haircuts and things like that can affect an athlete. But his point is more subtle. Find a week where you're not competing and get your haircut then. That will give you a natural deloading. His competition ideas worked so well. Uh, uh, it's interesting because Coach Ralph Mon at Utah State and Maffey Tone really did have a lot of the same ideas about competition. Um, uh, he talks a lot about water. He talks about being careful of certain foods. You know, uh, the night before the Nationals, don't eat fish. Fish is great, but when you're on the road, you never know about fish on the road. I have a story about competing in Hawaii. I'm not going to share it with you, but trust me, I learned a lesson. Uh, be careful of spicy food. Uh, make sure you get plenty of water. Don't indulge in a lot of drinking. Uh, after competition, you know, it's not a terrible idea to get a a bowl of vegetable soup in there with all the minerals and the good things that are in vegetable soup. A coach monism, competition is a training day. Uh, I use this concept coaching uh, sprinters. Now I was the head coach, but we began using, we would try to get into up to three competitions a week. I'm kind of proud of the following thing, but I had this uh, here in Utah, my track and field team, and it, it still delights me to think about it adopted the, the, the Utah School of the Deaf, Deaf track team, the Utah School of the Deaf track team. Uh, they didn't have any equipment. They didn't have any uniforms. So we provided them with discs and shots and javelins, uh, training gear as much as we could. It was marvelous. But what we did was because they have had a hard time getting the meets, uh, we brought them to several smaller meets, is that we would have a weekly track me with them and it was wonderful they didn't have a big team but what it allowed us to do is to time our sprinters and our middle distance runners in races well that meet and a region meet and a competition uh, invitation on the weekend gave our athletes three competitions a week sunday we didn't do anything but those three then then we just fit four rest days on top of it where they kind of just went through mobility and flexibility and, you know, general warming up. This came right out of Maffey Tone's work. Now, some of you are going to hear that there's a conflict here. I'm talking about high school athletes who can rebound in eight minutes. But the idea was when they competed in a track meet, they went top end. 
So they were getting a hundred meters, a 200 meters and a four by one relay, but where they were going at top speed and that seemed to help them carry over. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Maffey Tone got me into drinking V8. He has something called the V8 diet where you, you know, you eat three basically yes meals a day. Uh, and then you also, you supplement it with drinking uh, servings of uh, V8 or tomato juice. Um, oddly, I still do that to this day. Uh, he's the first person that ever uh, basically said fats are fine. Uh, in fact, a higher fat diet is probably better for you than uh, some of the crappy fats that most of our athletes eat. Um, he also emphasized, like Devaney will, the use of cold water to get brown fat mobilized, uh, that uh, magic fat that's up here in your body that makes you uh, deal with cold. And also, too, uh, the idea of shivering as a body fat, uh, I hate to call it the fat loss program, but shivering seems to help your body use fat better. He also has this wonderful line, if Einstein were your coach, uh, which we've discovered happening many times, a one hour workout should feel like one hour. If it feels like 10 minutes or 12 hours, something's wrong there. Uh, an hour should feel like an hour. When we do the 30 for 30 for 30 workout, 30 seconds lifting, 30 seconds rest for 30 minutes, many people say towards the end, that rest period didn't feel like 30 seconds, which to me indicates that maybe their conditioning isn't where it should be. And of course, the thing I learned mostly about uh, the most from uh, Maffey Tone is the idea of the importance of patience when working towards any goal at all. And uh, my hat's off to you, Phil Maffey Tone, because that helped me not only as an athlete, but as a coach. Finally, I want to move to talking about Art Devaney. In 1998, when I first got online, my second email was to Rob Wolf, who's become very famous in our field uh, with the paleo idea. He, uh, he also killed a caribou in a TV show one time with a stick. So hats off to Rob. And Rob really helped me understand the work of Art Devaney. When I first got on the internet in 1998, it was mostly overrun by what they called themselves hit Jedis, high intensity training. Uh, these were all people who said that they were slow gainers, that God had inflicted them with this problem that they could not make progress. So they should only train once every six weeks. I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating. But then I found the work of Clarence Bass. And then I found the work of this little site where I, I where Lorraine, Lauren Cordain talked about, and I found out about Rob Wolf. He introduced me to Art Devaney. So at this time, the internet, besides the, when I got away from the hit Jedis, I found these things called paleo, paleo diet. Uh, my wife and I interpreted them to becoming meat, leaves, and berries, which basically we still do. Uh, it also became noted for like eat like a caveman, the caveman diet. Um, Neander Thin was another book. Uh, um, diet, diet evolution, diet revolution, uh, all kinds of books with evolutionary fitness in them. And then of course the word primal showed up. And of course I call it here in the notes primal and I have X, Y, and Z primal diet, primal training, primal, you name it. And at the time, and I thought it was earlier than this, but the only ex example I could find was a copyright of 2000, though I think it was there earlier, of the Evolutionary Fitness PDF <clears throat> by Art Devaney. It's still available online. Um, it still remains one of the most intelligent, thought-out nutrition and training things I've ever seen in my life. Basically, when you read it, certain things really would hit you. First off is Devaney's insistence on less is more, especially when it comes to diet, fasting, and exercise. He also brought up some concepts I, I really didn't know much about. The first is power laws. It's interesting because now it's a phrase I don't think I go a day without using. The next was fractals, which I had read in Jurassic Park and 
the movie would be coming out about this time. And then, of course, this really important line from Art Devaney, there is no failure, only feedback. He didn't believe in making goals. He didn't believe in keeping journals because the only thing you need to look at is the feedback. You know, you can have, you can have all these things that if, if something doesn't work, it gives you more information. If something does work, it gives you more information. And you keep compiling those things and great things tend to happen. There's, by the way, I'm not, throughout this whole talk, I'm not knocking anyone. There's nothing negative at all. My only wish, and I know it wouldn't have sold, but Devaney's great insights didn't come from studying anthropology. It came from a much more personal thing. And I'd like to talk about it. Art's wife and son both had diabetes. Now, I know I say diabetes wrong, so just go with it, okay? So his wife and his son both had uh, type two, type 1 diabetes. And he used, uh, Art Devaney is, was a professor of economics. In fact, some of his most interesting reading is on Hollywood economics. I, the book is fascinating. Um, what he began doing was using his studies in economics to understand the cause and effect of food on his wife and children. He began to notice certain things. Sugar was terrible for his wife and child. Um, baked goods were terrible for his wife and child. Uh, beans probably weren't very good. Boom. And pretty soon he began picking up that food that was around 40,000 years ago seemed fine for his wife and son. He says in uh, several articles and in his book, The Devaney Diet, uh, that's the British edition, the the evolution connection just happened because my anthropology colleagues told me I was eating hunter-gatherer diet when I talked to them. So from there, he got himself into this eat like caveman uh, and some of the other things. But it originally came, and I think lovingly and brilliantly, from studying the effects of food on diabetics. Now, there's a couple of points that I want to make sure we go over a little bit. The first is his use of fractals. Now, I was, not long ago, I, I read uh, Benoit B. Mandelbrot's book, The Fractalist, Memoirs of a Scientific Maverick. Uh, <clears throat> so, when you watch Jurassic Park, Malcolm, the guy who wears all black, talks about fractals. Now, it's, it's kind of simple, really. Um... A small rock sort of kind of looks like a mountain. A leaf sort of kind of looks like a, a tree. Well, what fractals are is how patterns of variation come up. I'll have I'll explain it with Art's words in just a moment. When I read Mandelbrot's book, the first thing I came away with was this wonderful understanding I had in variations. And I came up with basically three words to explain it. When something happens, and by the way, there's only feedback when something happens. The variations are mild, wild, or no. You know, to be honest with you, and certainly my heart goes out to everyone who was impacted by 9-11, September 11th, 2001. My wife was in Manhattan. It took us a long time to get her home. And she watched the second plane go in. And she did not sleep well for a long time. And I realized that deaths were terrible. And I told my and my daughters when we were able to talk father to child that uh, the world that they know was going to change. As I look back, honestly, and certainly if you lost your father or friend uh, or mother, I, I, my heart goes out to you. Having said that, though, though the impact of most Americans was... Uh, the lines and security at, uh, at airports is longer. Um, I, I'm, a lot of people join the service. Uh, a lot of people, things happen certainly, but for the typical American anyway, uh, the variation was mild. You can certainly disagree with me on this, and, I, and I'm fine, but it's one of those things where you go, hmm. Now, <clears throat> if you were a Syrian or an Iraqi, what things are wild. 
Uh, when it comes to training, when people ask me about how should I vary my training, generally I give them this answer. Mild, wild, no. So mild variation is what we call same but different. You go from bench press to incline press. You go from incline press to military press. Wild would be going from uh, a regimented bodybuilding program where you do 9 to 15 exercises to one lift a day. Or if you train with me, going from one lift a day to the traditional bodybuilding thing. Those would be a more wild fluctuation. Or something I did in my career because of uh, some injuries in the Middle East experience. I went from being a thrower to a triathlete. Wow, that was a different world. I had to learn how to swim bilaterally, breathing out of both sides. I had to learn to ri ride a bike differently. I had to do a whole bunch of things. And then when I went back to throwing, some of that toolkit really helped me. Or no variation is this. Eh, we're staying with it. Um, you'll notice that in uh, nutrition, uh, mild variation might be going from uh, fat-free milk to heavy cream. Wild would be going from carnivore to vegetarian. And no vegetarian, uh, no variation is what most of us do. Devaney explains it like this. Fractals appear in all self-organized systems. The blood vessels form a fractal like a mountain range. The healthy heart beats to a fractal pattern, not consistently the same. Markets produce fractal st statistics. And we're going through one now. Hormone release is almost like a pulsing quasar with intermittent bursts of all sizes. The distribution of prey is a fractal, as are the activity patterns of hunters, children at play, and most sports but for dreaded jogging and other non-natural exercises. Jogging is not fractal. It's steady state. Uh, rowing for an hour is steady state. Is there value to it? Well, y yes, but it's not the way of the world. When you watch children play, tag, and hide-and-go-seek, I can almost guarantee were games that were played by our, uh, our family members 40,000 years ago. They are great games for hunting and uh, protection. Um, there's brief spurts of uh, sprinting to base or away from it. And then lots of time just kind of hanging around. Um, it's the way you should train too. And then of course there's something called power laws. And if you read the work of Nassim Taleb, uh, the barbell theory, which is how I do my investments, extremely, extremely safe and crazy wild. Or the hockey stick thing. Let's get into some depth on that. So Art Devaney tells us, you mix brief intermittent episodes of highly intense physical action with languid peri periods of and play. Uh, so you should have really, really hard workouts and go for a walk. You should have uh, an intense little training session and then play tag with the kids. Mark Sisson does a nice job of this with his primal laws. Uh, on his blueprint, law number three is move frequently at a slow pace. Rule four, law four is lift heavy things. And law five is sprint once in a while. Boy, that is a wonderful way to explain this whole very complex concept called power laws. Um, I work with professional baseball teams. And one of the things I try to explain to them is that they are, they are the most power law sport I've ever seen. Uh, the crack of a bat, whoosh, and then periods of very calm, very quiet things. And the tension builds up, and then strike out or home run. It's, uh, and then long periods of nothing, and then as exciting as anything that can happen in sports. Now, this is an example of a Devaney workout. He, I, I, as I was studying his things, and Going through the internet, I found dozens of examples. <clears throat> this is this is basically one of one of his hierarchical workouts that he called, that was a set of fifteen slow reps, set of eight followed immediately, set of eight medium immediately followed by a set of four fast push press, bent arm pullovers, machine rows, machine press, concentration curls, leg curls, squats, deadlifts, squat followed by deadlift. It's rough. Incline dumbbell press, the standing crane yoga position, ab hang, in the hanging with your uh, knees bent, and then Tabata cycle 
and arm do, dyno. That's eight minutes at the bodice. Uh, that's a really rough workout. Uh, now the thing is with the fifteen eight four, those once you're set up and start, it doesn't take long at all to do those. Um, I would say around for us when we do it with goblet squats uh, and uh, various arm work, uh, it's very fast. Uh, you're looking at a minute and a half. So the movements itself don't take long. It'd be the setup between movements. It would take a while. But still, anytime you do leg curls followed by squats followed by deadlifts, that's going to be a tough workout, folks. He emphasizes here what he calls as the X look. So for women and men, broad shoulders, narrow waist, you know, powerful thighs, and uh, not a lot of extraneous here. Uh, he didn't. He doesn't like this look at all. He likes the the tall, broad look. Um, <clears throat> the example he used one time was Raquel Welsh in One Million Years A.D. And uh, hats off, that was a good example because I knew exactly what you meant. Now, from an evolutionary perspective, each of them tends to tie in and say basically the same things. And the reason I bring up evolutionary is because the impact that the paleo movement had on my career, uh, both in nutrition and my understanding of training, uh, right or wrong, it doesn't matter. But at the height of the paleo stuff, I kept learning every day about how to help uh, what we would consider an everybody else or a normal client. Dardic, of course, his great insight was his observation of the health of sprinters in light of endurance athletes. Um, now, I'm sure some endurance athletes will argue this, but endurance athletes tend to deal with colds and flu a lot more than some other athletes. And Dardic tells us, people have been running for thousands of years and they don't die like that, uh, referring to James Fix. It must be something in the way people run now that causes heart failure after exertion. Interesting now, Devaney had just said the same thing uh, uh, um, in our readings here. Uh, in looking at lifestyle of technological primitive, technologically primitive peoples and wild animals such as cheetahs, he realized that alternating cycles of exertion and rest were the norm. Extended exertion is the exceptions. Now, some of you will call me today and say, well, you know, I read McDougall's book and there are hunter-gatherers that run down their prey. That's absolutely true. And we humans have this weird ability because of the way we sweat and our, where we have our hair and this little nuchal ridge in the back of our neck, we can run down prey. We can also get a big spear and take them down too as, as maybe more the norm historically. To take down big game, and if we study the, the Native Americans, how they did it, uh, we had multiple ways of doing it. Very often, um, they were more like uh, Devaney would argue, with lots of energy output and then lots of time uh, resting. Maffey Tone, uh, I'm going to quote uh, Christopher McDougall from the book Natural Born Hero here. One thing I started to realize while researching Natural Born Heroes, and I think Phil opened your mind to, is the animal aspect of humans. We are really animals. We like to think we're not animals, but the truth is we are. When you are out there far away from any light on any town, no store and no bottle of water, you start to think, I really am an animal, and you start surviving like an animal. You're literally like a wolf roaming the forest. Uh, we are we are animals we are we are mammals and we and when we when we get away from uh, all the conveniences of of human life like some of us during the lockdown and the virus uh we do kind of change the way we think about things and of course finally uh devaney it was listening to his colleagues that he got tied into the hunter gatherer concept of the evolutionary fitness pdf of course uh was brilliant, and of course he titled his book The New Evolution Diet. So all three of them would share in this idea about being proper animals. So as we come to the end here, I'd like to talk about the parallels. And these are things I'd like you to maybe carry on in your own training and, and coaching. The first is uh, Devaney and Dardic both refer to the brace or core balance here. This importance of learning to, to lock it, to have a a full-time weight belt around your waist. 
Matthew Tone goes on a little deeper and he talks about gut gut health in there, uh, the importance of having a healthy gut biome, uh, eating uh, foods like sauerkraut or kimchi, making sure you have your vitamin D, making sure you have plenty of uh, a diverse fiber balance going in there. All three of them basically would say that uh, we got to get away from a linear approach to getting in shape. Um, it has to be a little bit more cyclical. Um, I'm not a huge fan of periodization, but I'm a huge fan of this idea of undulating into a uh, condition or even into performance. Uh, all three agree recovery is part of training. And to be honest with you, that is something that's lost from the Soviet top-down, go for the burn, uh, go for the burn, let's jog three miles every day, jog three miles every day. Recovery has to be part of training. Recovery in the training time, too. Um, all three would have room for easy workouts and easy recovery. Uh, Mark Sisson's great insight about uh, making sure you go for those nice walks sometimes as part of your training. All three basically include lifting weights and doing uh, heart rate work, um, cardiovascular work, aerobic work. Uh, I like Dardick's approach of using weight room movements to do your heart rate training. I think that was a wonderful insight, um, which I have explored in the past. And as I think about it, I'd like to try some new experiments with it too. Um, one of my attempts with a 10,000 swing challenge was using my heart rate to, when my heart rate hit Maffey Tone's 180 minus number, I stopped swinging. When my heart rate got to 160 minus, I started again. Um, the problem that, that I had on that is at first in my, the first 100 plus swings, that the time between those sets was so long. Of course, when I got to swing 400, 450, 470, uh, uh, those numbers got a little bit uh, just odd. Uh, I'd have to look back at the numbers specifically, but I found it fascinating to do that. Um, veggies, protein, and water. All three of them agree there. Uh, you can you could raise your hand and say that uh, Dardick says it's okay to have beans and uh, Maffy Tone avoids them in the first two weeks and Devaney basically doesn't like them at all. But you get the point. Eat your veggies, eat your salads, you'll be fine. Maffy Tone and Devaney both specifically talk about cold water. And when I was at the Olympic Training Center in 84, they were very big into cold water therapy. So basically, I'm just going to say all three of them talk about that. The next one is this play. You got to have some fun. One of the things I like so much when I listen to Maffy Tone on podcasts is there's a bit of lightheartedness in his approach to uh, getting people in good shape. And I like that. Clearly Devaney pushes that quite a bit in his work. And well, when I read Dardic, the, the sense of play would work out very well there. And the real big point, I think all three authors would agree that you are the architect. It's, it's up to you to increase, increase your health, fitness, longevity, and performance. Longevity as best you can, performance as best you can. And I like that, the idea that don't let somebody else tell you, uh, do this, do this, do this, do this. And you'll notice that many of my programs, there's very few, in fact, I call them bus bench programs. Mass Bain Simple, Big 21, um, there's a few others. But when I give a do this program, very often, it's only for three to six weeks with the understanding that it's a one hit. And then we got to get back to what makes you tick. Um, it's a, my, my final note here. The top-down command system isn't going to work. I hope you learned something here because I certainly did. And what I wanted to share with you is this idea overall is that many of us are still stuck in that 70s mindset, early 80s mindset of marathon sessions in the weight room. Uh, this idea of steady state, go, you know, go, 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 come back. 
uh, go for the burn, uh, get the pump and all that. And they all, it has value and, and that's fine. But what I'm trying to edge people to is a different vision of things. You know, you, the architect of your success, have some fun, get outside, make sure your recovery is a major part of what you think about and get away from being told what to do and start using your own imagination for your own fitness and health goals. I hope you enjoyed this. I'm Dan John. Thank you very much.